Hello and welcome to another episode in the Godot Basics Tutorial Series. Godot Tutorials is not affiliated with or sponsored by Godot Game Engine. In this episode, we will be taking a look at the HTTP request node. As a programmer, when dealing with HTTP requests, you will have to deal with and handle your requests based on different situations. The easiest way to deal with HTTP requests is through the HTTP request node. The HTTP request inherits from the node class, which means we do have access to the lifecycle scripts. And it basically allows us to send and receive HTTP requests. The HTTP request node uses the HTTP client class under the hood. We won't be going over HTTP client class in too much detail in this series. Towards the end of the episode, I will make recommendations to two channels. Before we get into HTTP request node, first let's dive a little bit into the HTTP client class. The HTTP client class inherits from reference. Basically, the HTTP client class is a low level hypertext transfer protocol client. Now, even though we aren't going into too much detail over the HTTP client class, the HTTP client class does come with three enumeration types. The first is method, the second is status, and the third is response code. And we're going to need to understand these enumeration types from HTTP client in order to properly use the HTTP request node. First is the method enumeration from HTTP client. You have 10 choices. The enumeration values are integers zero through nine, and each one stands for a different type of request or in this case, method request. Method get is the value of zero. Method post has the value of two. Method put is three. Method delete is four. And method patch is eight. In this episode, I won't go over the different types of methods because we went over that in the last episode. Moving on. Now, the second type is the enumeration status type. And even though you will most likely never use this with the HTTP request node, let's go over it briefly. The enumeration status type comes with 10 different options. I list the ones that might be most appropriate for you. That would be disconnected, connecting, connected, requesting, and body. Lastly, let's go over the enumeration response code. The values range from integer values 100 through 510. The one you most likely are familiar with is the 200 status code, or in this case, the response code. And this just lets you know that your request has been received and properly responded to. When putting information into a server, you may get a 201 response code returned back to you by the server. For error codes, we do have 400, 401, and 403. 400 lets you know that something wrong happened with your request. You also have the 401 response code, which is just an unauthorized response code. What that means is that even though something exists on the server, you do not have access to it. And lastly, the 403 response code, which just means that something exists on the server, but it is forbidden for you to access. The difference between a 401 and 403 is 401, you have an identification tied to you, whereas 403, the server has no clue who you are. And lastly, I do want to point out that there is a response code zero, which is basically a response code error for you. And even though it is not in the documentation, if you are given the response code zero, it does mean that something wrong happened. Let's move on to HTTP request node enumeration types. So the HTTP request node comes with only one enumeration type called result. The result enumeration type comes with 13 different options. The one you will most likely be familiar with is the integer value zero, which means that a request has been received and properly responded to. If a server cannot be connected to you, you will receive the integer value three, which is result can't resolve. If no response is given, it will give you a integer value six. If a request failed, an integer value eight. And if a request has been timed out, you will be given an integer value 12. Let's go 
over a quick view of the HTTP request node and how it sends data to a server. So first, you use the HTTP request node to request information from a server. When the server has received your request, it will respond appropriately. Afterwards, your HTTP request will need to do something with the returned data. And that's basically it for the HTTP request node. Now, in order to send a request to a server, you're going to need to use the request method. The request method takes in five arguments. The ones highlighted in yellow are the ones you will most likely need to edit for basic usage. The first argument is the string URL of the data you wish to access. This will most likely be your API. And of course, in the fourth argument, you can set what type of method requests you'd like to send to the server. The fifth argument is equally important if you're using post or put, and that is the request data that you wish to send to the server so that it can properly update, create, or edit itself. Now, once a request has been sent to a server, a server will respond back. And when a server responds data back, the HTTP request node will then call the request completed signal. So let's go ahead and take a look at the request completed signal. The request completed signal runs after a response is sent from the server. The request completed signal comes with four arguments that represent different information that the server will respond back to you. The first is going to be the result enumeration type. If everything went okay, this will most likely be the integer value zero. The second argument is the response code enumeration type, and it will be an integer value. Again, the values range from 100 through 510. In most cases, if all went well, you will be receiving the integer value 200 or 201, depending. The third argument are headers, and if you need access to the header values that are sent from the server, you will grab that from the third argument called headers. But for now, we can just ignore that. And lastly, the data being sent from the server will be in the fourth argument called body, and it is a pool byte array data type. And just as the name suggests, you will be given back a pool array of bytes. Because you are given a pool byte array data type, you will need to do conversion from that into ASCII or UTF-8. Don't worry about it. The pool byte array makes it very simple to convert from pool byte array into UTF-8 encoding. Before we take a look at code, let's go over the result enumeration type versus the response code enumeration type. The result enumeration lets you know whether a server has responded back to you. This is different than a response code because a response code lets you know what type of server response was sent only if a server responds back. Let's go ahead and take a look at a quick example. Here we can see that the request completed signal gives us a result value and a response code value. In this case, we sent a request to the server. We responded back successfully. Our result will be zero. But as a matter of fact, we can still get a result enumeration integer value of zero even if the server responds back with a 401 status code. And that's because result only cares if a server has responded back. The response code cares what type of response is sent back by the server. And so even if we have successfully retrieved information or we have been denied access, our result will still be zero. Now let's take a look at a second example. Let's say we send a server response to something that doesn't exist. Well, our result will be three. The integer three just means that the server cannot be resolved. And even though it cannot be resolved, our response code in this case will be zero. And so if you want to do something special for your players, you will do that based on the response code enumeration value versus the result enumeration value. However, the result enumeration value is useful for knowing whether or not we have in fact connected to the server. So to reiterate, the response code lets us know how the server responded to our request, whereas the result enumeration lets us know whether or not we did in fact connect to a server. For this code example, we will be using the Star Wars API endpoint. You can use any API endpoint you want to test out HTTP requests. However, I like Star Wars, so we are going to use 
the Star Wars API. Now, first, when you grab an API that's publicly available, you need to see how the data is going to be returned back to you. So let's go ahead and take a look at doing that right now. So first, it's letting us know that we need to add HTTPS followed by swappy.dev followed by slash API slash followed by the information we want from our API endpoint. Now, this example is letting us know that we need to end with a slash. And in this example, people slash one slash returns back to us Luke Skywalker. To get the name of our person one, it's under name. To get height, it's under height. But basically, it's letting us know that once we receive the JSON file, the information is available straight for us. What this means is it's not nested under something, most likely results or data. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's look look at something like people. So if we do people slash and we press the request button, notice how the information is different because it's giving us all the people in the API endpoint versus people slash one slash, which just gives us Luke Skywalker. So in this case, it gives us our count which helps us iterate the array. We can also iterate an array just by looping over the length of an array, but it's always good to have the count. And so that's what this information is telling us. The Star Wars API gives us the count. On top of that, it's also letting us know that all the relevant information is nested under the results. And so results, as you can see, an open bracket means it's an array. And so the first element of the array is Luke Skywalker with the ID 1. And if you keep scrolling, you should see C3PO with an ID of 2 and so forth. Now, what's interesting about this API is it comes with a URL. It lets us know how to access that specific data. And if we were to just put that on the screen in the URL section, and we were to go ahead and press enter, you can see that we are able to see specifically what we're going to get back, or rather what we should expect back from the API endpoint. In this case, it's letting us know that in order to retrieve this API endpoint, we need to use the get request method. We should expect back the request status code of 200. The content type we should be expecting back is application JSON file. And this is an important one. It's letting us know what it is allowing. So it's letting us know that the only request methods this API endpoint will accept is the get request method, the head request method, and the options request method. And of course, it's letting us know what information we should be expecting for data from everything highlighted. And this is good to know when we want to test out HTTP request note. Most likely you will have something similar set up for your API endpoint. Again, this episode's not going to talk about creating your own API endpoints. I'm going to link two different YouTube channels that go over HTTP and server creation. But regardless, let's go ahead and check out how to access this API through the HTTP request node. Now let's go ahead and take a look at an example. To add an HTTP request node onto the scene tree, go ahead, click on the plus button. You can type it out or find it. But regardless, you should find HTTP request. Go ahead down here and press the create button. This will add the HTTP request node onto the scene tree. Now, something to think about, and that is the use thread. If you ever find that your HTTP request node is being slow at some point in the game making process, you can in fact turn this on. What this does is when you make an HTTP request through the node, it will in fact create a new thread for you to handle that HTTP request in order to make sure you're not bogging down your main thread. And so even though by default it is set to false, it doesn't hurt to set this to true. Now you can either set it through the check mark or set it through the file and I'll show you how to do both. So to do it through the inspector just click that button to get the check mark and to set it through a script you're going to call the thread or in this case the use threads property. Now go ahead head over to your HTTP request node right click it go ahead and select attach script. It should automatically detect that it is an HTTP request node and select that it inherits from HTTP requests. Make sure you do that. You can set the name to whatever you wish to set your 
GD script file name to. In this case, I'm going to leave it to the default name HTTP request, which is the name of the node. I'm going to go ahead, press create, delete all the comments from the screen. Double check that you are in fact extending from HTTP request class, and we are ready to begin. First, we want to make sure that our node is in fact using threads. So let's go ahead. I'm going to use the self keyword to let you know that we're doing everything through the node class, followed by set use threads. And inside, we're going to set the value to true. We're going to pass it a Boolean value true. And this will make sure that our HTTP request node does in fact use threads. And Threads has the benefit of increasing performance, especially because we do not know how long it's going to take to receive back information. After that, we are going to need to create a connection. But before we create a connection, we need to connect the signal into a method. And so I'm going to create a new method. And in this case, I called the method do something. However, we need to give it four different arguments or the function will not work properly or excuse me the signal will not be able to pass all the relevant information especially the fourth argument which is the body of the data that we want to work on or work upon so in this case what you're going to do is make sure you are in fact inside the parentheses remember that the first value is a result the second is the response code the third will be headers, and the fourth will be the body, which is a pull byte array. And of course, if you want to strict type the data, you can in fact go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So the first two values are going to be int. This is going to be pull byte array. And the headers, which we don't really care about, is going to be a pull string array. By doing this, the code becomes clear which argument has what type of data. The first two being ints, the third argument being a pull string, the fourth argument being a pull byte. But because all of this doesn't fit on the screen, I'm going to remove them all. Let's move on. So let's add the connection. I'm going to use the self keyword to show again that we're using everything inside the array or excuse me, the class, we're going to use the connect. Now, we're going to go ahead and remember that the first argument has to be a string value of the signal name. Lucky for us, we do see the request completed. So you can go ahead, either add the string or double click request underscore completed. I'm going to go ahead and click that. Now again, request completed is the signal that gets called once an HTTP request has been responded to by the server. We're going to follow that by a comma. We're going to have to pick our target. In this case, it's going to be ourselves. So I'm going to use the self keyword for that. And then lastly, we have to pick a method to connect our signal to. And as you can see here, it gives us some options. However, do something is not listed. And that's okay because we can in fact use the string do something and it should resolve the error. Now let's go ahead and add the request method. So I'm going to use the self keyword again, followed by request. It is auto completed for me. I'm going to just go ahead, pick request. We have to pick in this case, arguments, the first argument being the URL, the last being the data. In this case, because we're using the get method, all we need to provide is one argument and that will be the string URL. So let's go ahead and do that. If you remember, it's going to be HTTPS colon slash slash swapy dot dev and that's going to be preceded by a slash followed by api followed by another slash and in this case let's go ahead and just grab luke skywalker and remember you have to end with a slash because that's what the api documentation was telling us it needs trailing slashes in your api endpoint and just if i wasn't clear the url you're calling to get data from the api is what we call an api endpoint so again, everything highlighted here is what we call an API endpoint. Now, once the server has responded back to us, what's going to happen is we're going to call the request completed signal, and we're going to call the do something method inside of our 
cells, then we're going to get back information that would include the result enumeration value, the response code enumeration value, header information, and most importantly, the body. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just print the body. Let's see if in fact this setup works. I'm going to go ahead, press the play button. If we look down here, we can see that in fact the request has worked. Now, something interesting has happened. We don't actually see the readable format that I showed you on the website. Now, because the information being given back to us is bytes and we need to convert that into string, luckily the pull byte array data type does in fact come with a method to do that called get string from UTF-8. Now, let me go ahead and add the fact that this is a pull byte array. Add some space and at the very top, we're going to get our data we're going to get the body followed by the dot notation followed by get and we're given auto completes and that's because i went ahead and hard coded that the body is in fact a pull byte array the difference between ascii and utf8 is if you know you're getting bytes that fit inside the ascii encoding you can go ahead and choose that to get a bump in speed. However, I recommend that you use the, in this case, get string from UTF because we do not know what we're being given back from the server. And so once we do that, we are converting our bytes into string. We can go ahead and print the new variable called data inside the print method. We can go ahead, get rid of pass. When we press the play button, what we should get back is in fact all the information we saw on the API website for Luke Skywalker, in this case, people slash one. Now that you saw how to do a get request, let's go ahead and take a look at how to post a request, or in this case, how to edit information to an API endpoint. Now, we cannot edit API endpoints on the Star Wars API, but let's just pretend that we can. So first, you need to create a variable for the pool string array. In this case, we're going to create a variable headers, call it a pool string array. In this case, it's just an empty array. We don't want to do anything with it. In our request method, what we would do is follow the API endpoint in which we wish to update, followed by the comma, followed by custom headers. In this case, we have our headers variable. Next, we add the Boolean value to see if we want to validate the domain. In this case, we're going to leave it as true which was the default value. Now, the fourth argument will be the method type. In this case, because we're editing already existing data on the API endpoint, we would pick the method put enum value, followed by comma, followed by the string information we wish to edit on the server. So for example, we could say name Jane Skywalker. We're just playing pretend here, but you would in fact put your data right here and the server side would handle interpreting that data in order to edit it. In this case, we're passing a string value. However, Godot doesn't allow us to send JSON values, only string values. So on the server, you would have to interpret the string into JSON most likely. But again, that all depends on the API server. Now I'm going to go ahead and just comment this out for you because I'm going to upload this to GitHub. However, I'm going to add the request back. Now let's do something a little more advanced, just slightly. Now, normally we want to do something for the user once we received data. So in this case, that would be the response code. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, normally we would do something like if our response code is equivalent to 201, we're going to actually print the data, right? Or in this case, we would actually do everything to make sure that we don't have any errors. So in this case, if response code is equivalent to the integer value 201, or excuse me, in this case, 200, because we're not editing anything on the server, we're going to go ahead and convert the body from bytes to string, put that into a variable called data, and then we're going to print everything inside the variable data into the console. And then else, we're going to say that there was a problem on the server. Now we can actually test this out. Now we do know that the people has a count of 
I believe it was 82 or 86. So if we go to 120, we should be fine. Normally that does not exist on the API endpoint. If we press play, what we should get is problem on the server. And of course, we'd also like to see what kind of response code were being sent by the server. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually print response code followed by colon followed by space followed by the actual response code being returned back to us by the server and now if we press play we can see that in fact we're getting a 404 error the 404 error just means that the data was not found on the server and so this is just the basic setup of what you are expected to do when you are requesting information from a server and that's because if the server is down or in this case if the information does not exist on the server you want to have a in this case a backup plan on what to present to your game player user depending on the response code of the server. So in this case, for the user, we just want to print out to the console the information being sent back to us. And if there's an issue with the server, we just want to let them know that there's a problem with the server. Please try again later. I'm going to recommend two YouTube channels to get more information on Godot and HTTP. The first YouTube channel is called Game Development Center. I highly recommend checking this channel out, especially their server series. The second channel is called Generalist Programmer, and I highly recommend the HTTP series. I'm going to go ahead and leave links to their YouTube channels in the description down below. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter if you want to see live updates of when I'm editing or shooting a video. And don't forget to subscribe to my subscriber list on my website godotutorials.com if you want weekly updates. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for clicking the like button and thank you for clicking the subscribe button. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.